one of the coolest parts of this trip was that we went to Dell Children's Hospital and we went to the cafeteria there. Recently, I was in Arizona and I went to the University of Arizona where I went to medical school and went to the hospital cafeteria there. That's right. I forgot you're a wildcat. <clears throat> yeah. And I went My to- My forks up. Anybody's watching right now, but continue. <laughs> and, uh, ASU and, doesn't produce doctors, so uh, yeah, the, <laughs> he got his beat It's there. true. It's true. <laughs> but, and then we went to the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale. We went to both of those cafeterias. What a, both of those cafeterias cook in? Canola oil. Pam. It's everywhere. Like hospital cafeterias. Western medicine believes in canola oil. They They- promote this. The American Heart Association promotes seed oils. Absolutely. The 2020 to 2025, the 2020 to 2025 guidelines from the United States, you know, FDA promote seed oils. They promote it. And so, of course, you're going to find it in hospital cafeterias, but we go to Dell Children's and I'm thinking, this is a children's hospital. They're treating kids with cancer, diabetes, um, neurodegenerative diseases. Like that's the most heart wrenching stuff you've got, right? Kids suffering. It's the same. They have seed oils everywhere. There's no appreciation for this. They still are bought into the narrative. We went to the hot bar where they'll saute you some greens or some meat and chicken. They're using canola oil in the hot bar. They'll saute it right there for you. And I said, I'm allergic to that. Do you guys have anything else? Do you have butter? And one guy goes, yeah, we have butter. And the sous chef right next to him goes, yeah, but the butter has vegetable oil in it. <laughs> the butter's not butter. The butter's not butter. I can't believe it's not butter. It's, it's actually, not actually not, butter. It's not actually butter. <laughs> you go over to the chicken fingers and French fries, and I ask the really nice guy behind the counter, hey, what oil is that cooked in? I've got some sensitivities. He pulls out the box, cotton seed, which is even worse, canola, there's THBQ, which is a preservative, and an anti-foaming agent. Like That's what you're getting chicken fingers cooked in, and we'll talk about why all those are horrible. You go to the other line where you can get grilled chicken and it's, you can, it's glistening. I know there's oil on it. And I say, what's the chicken cooked in? They've also got salmon there, right? Salmon is healthy, right? Salmon and chicken. What are those cooked in? And the lady behind the counter, super nice lady. I don't know. I have to go ask the chef. The chef comes out, salad oil. What's salad oil, man? <laughs> it's Pam. It's canola oil. So everything in the, in the kitchen, the salad dressing, the chicken, the salmon, the sautéed noodles, the, the sautéed vegetables, the, the chicken fingers, the french fries, it's all cooked in seed oils. And they also serve Snickers bars and Reese's Pieces and- Yeah, they got all the shit there. Yeah, yeah. Was, I mean, the, you could- got you, all the shit You there. could walk through and just eat some leaves, you know, and maybe get an apple and a banana and you'd be, that'd be okay. But you can't get any meat. You can't get anything cooked hot in that whole kitchen. You're going to get seed oils. You're going to get, you know- you could do it, but you'd basically just, you'd be better off fasting. So the point of that is just to say that seed oils are pervasive. And so circling back to the satiety thing, this is super interesting. The, the problem with seed oils appears to be this evolutionarily inconsistent concentration of linoleic acid. So we did a reel on this on Instagram um, that I was really proud of. In order to get the amount of uh, seed oil from corn that the average American gets per day, five to seven tablespoons, you would have to eat between 60 and 70 ears of corn per day. Damn! Wow. You'd have to eat a pound and a half of hulled sunflower seeds, two and a half <laughs> pounds of in the husks, right? So, you know, the baseball players will spit the sunflower uh -huh. seeds. Like, this is a mountain of sunflower seeds. No one could ever get through that. Two and a half pounds of sunflower seeds, if you're shuck, if you're like husking them or whatever, you know, spitting them out every day, every, you know, you're spitting the husk out two and a half pounds of sunflower seeds to get five to seven tablespoons of sunflower seed oil, two pounds of soybeans to get five to seven tablespoons of soybean oil, two pounds of soybeans, two pounds. Um, and canola oil is made from a rapeseed. That's not even a human food. <laughs> and in order to make canola oil, canola stands for Canadian oil low acid. So it's an acronym. It wasn't even a thing. They had to graft and genetically select rape seeds that were low erucic acid. Erucic acid is, I believe it's a monounsaturated fatty acid that's been associated with uh, myocardial liposis. So heart lesions with this fatty acid found in this seed of a plant that humans should not be eating, has never been eaten by humans as a food, but they made it into a food Previously, like all the seed oils, like cotton seed oil, especially that, that they're making uh, the chicken fingers and the fries out of at Dell Children's, machine lubricants prior to 1910, right? These are not foods for the humans. So there's, there's no equivalent in rape seeds because humans don't eat rape seeds. We don't eat cotton seeds. I have no idea how many cotton seeds, I'm, nobody eats cotton, right? You're not going to eat cotton. Yeah. 
You don't, there's no people didn't eat soy for the longest time. It was only brought into fields to help nitrogenate the next year's crop. That was it. Yeah. So there's a massive amount. So evolutionarily inconsistent amounts of linoleic acid that easily get concentrated in these oils. So we suddenly have this huge influx of linoleic acid into our diets. And it accumulates in every cell in our body and especially in our fat tissue. Because as humans, we can't get rid of polyunsaturated fatty acids easily. One of your questions before the podcast was, how do we get rid of this? And we'll talk about it before we wrap this one up for sure. Because some people listening, I know maybe just hearing about this idea of seed oils and maybe they want to change this, but I want them to understand that if you've been eating seed oils for 30 or 40 years, you are basically full of seed oils. And uh, you're like a sponge and you need to figure out how does your body get rid of them? Your body will recycle them over time, but you have to stop eating them. But our body stores these oils. You can look at an adipose tissue. So a fatty acid, t- fatty acid, a fatty tissue depot, like the butt or the glute or behind the tricep. And you can see how much linoleic acid is in the fat. And that's a pretty good indication of how much linoleic acid someone has been eating. Blood levels, not so good. And we'll talk about why, because primarily because the linoleic acid breaks down. And so in the blood, it can be broken down. So if you see lower levels of linoleic acid in the blood, it can mean that it's just breaking down into HNE, which is the bad byproduct of linoleic acid that causes many problems for humans. So blood levels of linoleic acid, not a good indicator. Fatty acid levels, I mean, excuse me, fat tissue depot levels, that's a good indicator of how much you've been eating. We store it. We don't get rid of polyunsaturated fatty acids very easily. So the more you eat, the more you store, the more your cell membranes get full of this. And we'll talk about what that does in terms of the mechanistic side of metabolic resistance in a moment. But so when you eat linoleic acid, right, you say you have chicken fingers or French fries or, or even noodles or chicken sauteed in canola oil or um, worse would be soybean oil because it has more linoleic acid. Worse even that would be cottonseed oil, right? The more linoleic acid, probably the worse for humans from an evolutionary perspective. You're just concentrating the stuff. So in the gut, so you eat it, you eat the food, it goes into your stomach and then it moves out of the stomach through something called the pyloric sphincter and, uh, and you, you move into... Uh, you know, you have the lower sphincters and you move into the duodenum, which is the first part of the gut beyond your stomach. There's a little, you know, bend in the stomach. And in that part of the small intestine, there appear to be receptors for cannabinoids, which are things like anandamide and um, AEA. So these are endogenous cannabinoids. So people know that when you smoke marijuana, you get the munchies because when you ingest cannabinoids, when you inhale THC or cannabidiol, the same mechanism is activated. There is a mechanism by which cannabinoids, whether it's THC, cannabidiol, or our endogenous cannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AEA, or 2-AG and AEA, um, they trigger hunger in humans. This is part of our programming as humans. And we know this very well. And so what happens is linoleic acid breaks down into those in the human gut. And there are receptors (laughs) for those cannabinoids in the human gut, which is crazy. And it's corroborated by the fact that you can fix all this by a surgery that we do called gastric bypass. So the way gastric bypass works is you cut the stomach. This is kind of um, medieval, but you cut the stomach at its intersection with the duodenum and you attach the stomach further down on the small intestine maybe somewhere in the jejunum or the distal duodenum. So basically what you're doing is you're creating a blind loop of bowel. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You have the duodenum where it attaches to the stomach and you're taking this duodenum, you're making a blind loop of bowel. You're bypassing all these, uh, and, and all these endogenous cannabinoid receptors and you connect the stomach down lower, right? So if you eat linoleic acid now, you missed all of these receptors that fixes satiety. Like almost instantly people become insulin sensitive overnight with the surgery. They lose weight immediately. Their satiety goes through the roof because you're bypassing all those receptors. You can still eat garbage, not a good thing. You can still eat the garbage and you'll bypass all the receptors, which is why it works. The problem is that you get a blind loop here. You malabsorb because there are other things you need to absorb in this section of the small intestine. Your body probably created that for a reason. And you, you think so? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your body probably created that for a reason. You get blind loop syndrome. You can get B12 deficiencies. You can get iron deficiencies, all kinds of problems. But, and the body can also then develop these receptors further down, more distally in the small intestine, and then the people end up with the same problem again. But it shows you the, the way that that surgery works. The ruin why gastric bypass probably just bypasses all of those mechanisms that create hijacked satiety in people who are eating garbage. And how often do people who are eating um, this way, how often do people who are getting the surgery get counseling 
to improve the quality of their food in a meaningful way. It doesn't happen often. They might say, eat more fiber, but are they going to say avoid seed oils? No. No, <laughs> no, no that's going to be included. Whatever, yeah. whatever shit pamphlet they have there that's going to be their nutritional guidelines is going to be inclusive of all the same things the American Heart Association is saying. Exactly. Whole grains. So we went, when I was in Arizona, we went to a bariatric clinic, which is the, sur- the surgery clinic where they do these type of things. They might do Ruin Y, which is the surgery I described, gastric bypass. They might do lap banding where they put the band around the stomach. All of these are medieval. They might do Gas, you might do like a sleeve gastrectomy where they just make the stomach smaller. And so on the second floor is the bariatrics clinic where they treat people who are obese with surgery. On the first floor, when you walk in, there's a snack stand. <laughs> What's at the snack stand? <laughs> Coffee cake, <laughs> Cheetos, tortilla chips, Doritos, Reese's peanut butter cups. What the what 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 clown world are we living in, man? It's crazy. So this is the type of hypocrisy you see in medicine all the time, right? First floor, they they give you snacks, they make you hungry. Second floor, they they cut your stomach out and they reroute your intestines. But you know, further down the mechanistic pathway with this satiety thing, there's drugs on both sides of this equation. So there are drugs we use in, when people have cancers that we give them cannabinoids um, to make them hungry because they get cachexia from cancer. So we give them cannabinoids to help with the appetite, right? People may use marijuana medicinally, quote unquote, to help with appetite when they're in the throes of a cancer because of this mechanism. Similarly, there's a drug that blocks these cannabinoid receptors, specifically the cannabinoid receptor 1, CB1 in the brain called Ramonabant. And Ramonabant may still be legal in Europe. It's not legal in the States. But the trials in the States clearly show that when you give people this drug that blocks CB1 in the brain, they lose weight. They become more insulin sensitive. They also commit suicide yeah. because... Well, Anandamide <laughs> was named after Ananda, which is bliss in Sanskrit, right? So it's the bliss chemical, right? It's and one of them, right? One of them. One of, the, one of them. Yeah, yeah. Most certainly. And that's what THC uh, sinks into, those same receptor sites as Anandamide. We have hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years of programming as humans. Uh, the reductionist physiology and nutrition doesn't work. You know, we need to understand that, hey, you're eating an evolutionarily inconsistent diet with these seed oils. That's the problem. The problem is not that you need to block the cannabinoid receptor system or, you know, you need, that's, that's, that's reductionist thinking. It's the same as, it's analogous to what we're doing with LDL. We're just, we're blocking, oh, you don't need LDL. You can just, you know, just take this PCSK9 inhibitor and, you know, you'll be fine. It's the same thing. You know, we wouldn't want to give people Ramona Band. Because you could just correct it and not eat seed oils, man. It's, 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 it's such a simple equation. But the proof of concept is there because the drug works and we know that it works. So I think that people on the calories in, calories outside will say people are sick because they're eating too much, but they will fail to think about why they're eating too much. Oh, they're just not disciplined enough. Or they're just not eating, they're just not moving enough. They're not exercising hard enough. And it, no, that these people are, I, I think these people in the calories in, calories out, um, the, the, very, the very zealous people in that situation, in, in that paradigm, are, are doing these other people who are trying to lose weight a disservice by not understanding the psychology behind all this and the way that these, these chemicals really hijack satiety and make it virtually impossible to stop eating. So it's not just, not just eating an extra 500 calories because you have bad genetics or because you're a bad person or because you know, you're, you're not strong enough mentally. Um, because you're not David Goggins, you're eating an extra 500 calories. It's not, it's not like that. It's just because you're eating foods, specifically seed oils probably, that are evolutionarily inappropriate. We never ate 70 years of corn and it's hijacking your satiety. So that's the problem. It's easily fixable. But when you do things like you say, everyone has atherosclerosis and therefore should be on statin. Everyone is overeating. Therefore, we should just eat less. You completely rob these people of the opportunity to find the root cause of their issue and make the appropriate change, which aligns everything and makes life so much better when you're not suffering in calorie-restricted prison or whatever sort of prison you're going to put yourself into with uh, an evolutionarily inappropriate action. So yes, it is calories in, calories out. But if you increase the quality of your food, your calories in will be easier. Your calories out will be different. And so that's the satiety equation. I'll pause there. But the next piece of the equation with seed oils, they're not just bad from that perspective. There's a really interesting set of evidence around cardiovascular disease that I want to talk about too.